Um, so today, today I'll be talking kind of about um, understanding the customer journey. Um, as I said, I'm Cara. <laughs> um, and so really the first thing is like, what do we mean by a customer journey? We talk about this a lot at Snowplow um, and that kind of really comes from like an underlying slight frustration with the way a lot of um, kind of very basic um, data analysis is handled in the traditional web analytics world of kind of just constructing um, very simple reports and, and everything based on, on sessionization and kind of a very one size fits all um, model. And um, kind of to go into this with really two examples, um, we'll look first at a very general example of, of users moving between devices. So maybe someone um, looking for a, a job on a job site, but maybe using a couple of different devices. And then we'll look more specifically at a snowplow case study um, something that we've implemented recently with, with one of our customers and to see kind of how your understanding of, of your users as a business can change when you're able to, to model the data in a way that makes sense for your business case and also um, you have the underlying data available. And, and we'll go into all of this in a bit more detail. If you have any questions, um, feel free to raise your, raise your hand and we can take them in the talk. We can also have some time at the end of the talk for questions. And, and as I said before, any more general snowplow related questions, feel free to just come find one of us at the end. Um, so to the first example, um, let's just consider like a simple scenario. Um, someone's at their job, they don't really like it. Um, in their lunch break, they're looking on their phone, looking at different um, jobs, but they don't really want to get them up on their, on their laptop um, during, during work. And so they just send like links with all the jobs that they like to their, um, to their own private email. Then they get home in the evening, they look through those email links, they select the handful of jobs that they, they really like the look of, maybe they do some more browsing on the site. Um, and then a couple of days later, maybe it's the weekend, they've got a bit more time and they can um, go into those jobs in more detail and then maybe send off some applications. So that seems kind of like a very reasonable way to go about finding a job from, from the user perspective. If you then look at this kind of from like a traditional web analytics perspective, you have this uh, case where, where you have, you see this as three distinct sessions. So the three kind of steps we had before, um, you'll have like one user session from someone searching on one device and, and looking at like maybe having three page views on a, on a search uh, page and then a couple of individual job edge page views. Um, then you have two more sessions, one where they're, they're looking at um, some of the jobs that they, they'd previously sent themselves and um, like maybe clicking through to some company sites, finding some more information. Um, lastly, the, the, the third case of then applying. And if you just look at these separately, you'd have one user, one session, a second user, two more sessions. Um, but we obviously know that user A and user B are actually the same person. If you just have like very simple reports that just aggregate stuff on a session level, that's the first thing you would miss. The second thing you would miss is that actually those two things are counted as separate sessions when really this entire, this entire process is, is one thing. And if you think about how, how, this, um, how this will affect maybe how you, you run your business, things might look very different like if you look at these two things separately if you look at these two things separately um this might suggest to you that your your job ad pages are really really good and people just seem to really like them and, and apply from there straight away when actually it could be that your job search pages are performing really good and because you you're not linking from there all the way through to the end that you're missing that step and and maybe that's where um, a lot of optimization could be done. And so really this is like a very basic example just to see how being able to model the data from the initial contact of a customer to kind of them completing the action that in your uh, business makes makes most sense as kind of like a conversion or, or something that they want to complete with your product um, is a lot nicer way of looking at the data than just like rigidly um, plucking it into sessions. Um, I don't know if there's any questions at this point, but obviously this is just a really kind of general example. Um, we can look at a more specific um, Snowplow case study in a second. Cool. So the next thing would be um, buying uh, a used car. And obviously just 
on the front, uh, starting off already, you can kind of imagine like buying a car is a, is a big decision for most people. And a lot of research gets done before people purchase a car because it really is a, a big investment. And so what you normally have is that people spend a really long time, 15, 20 hours, kind of looking at ads online, browsing dealership sites, spending a lot of time researching online. When they finally find their, their, their kind of favorite car that they would like to purchase, um, they then pick that car and find a dealership nearby that, that will sell that car. They will then go into the dealership and purchase the car there. So that, again, looks like a very reasonable path to take as a user. If we look at this, how this would be, be modeled in like a, a traditional a kind of analytics um, setup, that really completely breaks down here. Like you'd see lots of sessions of a user browsing um, websites. You'd get some information from your, your ad vendors saying that people saw certain ads. And then you have all these in-store purchases that you have in your transactional database. And really like there's no linking between whatsoever. And um, it's, it's really difficult to understand really what's driving people to come and purchase cars, like how are they making their decisions, and is any of the marketing you're spending on, on getting people to your website, which is the one thing you can measure, is kind of seeing where are people coming from to the site, is that worth um, the money? And so there, um, we had a, a car dealership come to us with exactly this scenario, and they said, we would really like to be able to tie together um, what happens in our stores with all that research and all those uh, all that advertisement we pay for um, online. And so going back to that um, kind of user journey, um, what we did is we implemented a Snowplow Pixel with a third-party cookie ID in, in all the display ads. Um, we have the Snowplow JavaScript hacker on, um, on the website. And then after purchase, um, we send a post-purchase email with some information about financing and insurance, which again contains a, pic, a Snowplow pixel and also um, sends through the purchase ID of that user. Therefore, you suddenly have one ID that goes through all and you can, you can connect the users um, across, um, across different sites. Of course, um, third-party cookies aren't always reliable, but um, from going, not being able to really connect any um, purchases to now being able to connect quite a few was, uh, was quite a, a good step forward. And so there really, as, as I said, um, because you have the first and third party cookie IDs, um, as well as the purchase ID, you will be able to stitch um, that user behavior together and really go from all the research a user has done online to that in-store purchase and then kind of start calculating how much have we spent to get this user? How can we optimize the way our website works, the way, um, the way we structure kind of the information about the cars on the site um, to drive people to, to make better purchasing decisions, to be able to find what they're looking for faster, and then ultimately to, to make them come into our, our shops and, and buy their dream car. Um, and so this is really a nice example how really having a single customer view online and offline can really help make um, the whole purchasing decision not only nicer for, for the dealership, but also for the users who are able to um, interact with the product better. And so kind of the, the key takeaways here are like, if you can collect the event level data, if you can collect that from multiple different platforms and not limited to one, um, online and offline, um, you, into a single data warehouse, that really allows you to understand your users better and improve your product accordingly. Um, also by controlling how that data is modeled, really looking at your individual business case as opposed to kind of just going um, with what, what is standard um, means that you can like dig into that behavior and, and understand what, how people are acting and, and what is driving their, um, um, their behavior. And that's really from there where you can start looking at more advanced analytics and start thinking about what, what, what's, it, can I predict how people are acting? Can I optimize how, my, how I'm like guiding them through that process um, and, and, and many more things. Um, I think that was it. Yes. <laughs> uh, does anyone have any questions? I know I went through that quite quickly. Um, if obviously, if you've, if you've never worked with Snowplow before, there might have been quite a few new things in there. So any questions, let me know. Yes. <laughs> 
Hi, I'm Dominic. Um, I just wanted to know uh, how that customer found an ad network that let you traffic third party cookies and pixels. The display ads. Yeah. So. Put a pixel. Oh, thank you. Um, so if you put a pixel and it's just an HTML pixel. No, how, how did he find, find one after GDPR? Well, um, this case was in North America. This <laughs> this that, customer that, is that's in an North awesome America. Answer, actually. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but I guess also, I mean, from like a conceptual perspective, I mean, the law is one thing, but also in this case, you are kind of um, using third-party cookies um, within your own use case. So you're not really like I think there's. Personally, I mean, obviously, I'm not a lawyer, and <laughs> please don't take my advice. But um, I think there is a difference with kind of using third-party cookies as a tool to interact with your customers, as opposed to kind of put, placing third-party cookies on on sites that have nothing to do with you to kind of sell information to to third parties which have no relationship with, with the client. Um, and so I think also we would feel differently about implementing something like that than than kind of using the more as a tool to to help people stitch their their in their customers because we do believe that when you um when you help people really understand their customers then it should be a win win like they should also make the whole process better for for the user and not just for the for the company. Um, with the first also Dominic. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we was even working together <laughs> several years ago. <laughs> so um, the first use case uh, you described with uh, two different users for one session and then two sessions from the same user. So how you connect the the users together and also like the session that everything of this, like all of these is like one big, one actually physical person behind the computer, which is sending links and doing stuff. Um, so it obviously requires them at some point in in their kind of lifetime not in necessarily in this scenario but at some point they have to uh, identify themselves on both platforms and so if they ever for example apply once from their phone and once from their laptop we then kind of like normally as as the first step of a data model um that we set up for people uh, we build like an identity stitching table with all the device identifiers on um on the mobile side on the website and any custom IDs that you set internally as, as a company. And then we use that so that if at any point in the future they come back on any device, we can stitch it back. But of course, you do require some sort of identification. I guess in this scenario, you could look at something um, decorating the links somehow so that when they send it to themselves an email, you send a, a device identifier with their or a cookie ID or something. Um, but you do you do need some stitch at some point. If, if the user never uh, connects a, like uses the same thing on on two different devices with identification, then then it's very difficult. Um, you can do things around kind of like IPs, but then it gets so um, <laughs> more more guesswork. I would I would say. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kara, for a really nice uh, really nice talk. It was really insightful. I think uh, that that there are many different platforms out there that talk about offering you like a, a cross device stitching uh, possibility, but because with, with Snowplow you can really control the event level data, that's probably one of the more powerful tools that's available to you, uh, or so, so, so I found. My, my, I have two questions. One is about data modeling and um, how you would model the stitching, is in which you do this in the pipeline itself, in an enriched phase, or would you do this later down the line uh, when the data has been loaded into your data warehouse? And then, um, how would you approach this on mobile? So, um, one very annoying feature among many annoying features of Facebook is that when you open an ad uh, inside of Facebook, it opens it in a separate kind of view portal from your normal browser on, on your mobile device, which means that a lot of the information you can use to stitch user data back to your internal user uh, ID has been lost. Uh, and then on top of that, there's a lot of other kind of problems that that you have on mobile when trying to stitch uh, an iPhone user with an iPad user, and so on and so on. So, very broad level, how, how would you approach those those uh, those problems? Of course. Um, so let's start with the first one, kind of around data modeling. Um, and there, I would say, obviously, both is possible. You can do the identity stitching kind of in 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 real time in the stream, or you can do it later in the data warehouse. And I think the main consideration is there whether or not 
um, you will be using it in real time. So if you need an applic if you, there's an application sitting on top of your stream that consumes it and needs to know whether or not we've seen this user before, then best thing to to have an enrichment, have maybe a, a AWS DynamoDB table that that contains that identity graph where you can just read and and check for every event and enrich it. If if you're not going to be using that data kind of in near real time and you it's really more for reporting purposes you want to basically build maybe a really nice attribution model or, or you want to kind of plan next month's marketing budget then then maybe it's not worth going through the effort of building kind of a real-time enrichment and it's much easier to just do that data modeling in the data warehouse and then to your second question around mobile um that's definitely a, a big issue that in the mobile world the whole um the kind of the world of stitching becomes a lot more complicated. We've seen a lot of users uh, use services such as Branch to kind of send links that they can add identifiers to to, to track them across. And so they kind of use um, other like parties that have agreements with Facebook or that allow you to decorate links to kind of get the information of how they came into the app or where they where they saw things and how they go out of the app maybe to walk to facebook to whatsapp um to instagram and then they use snowplow for the bit in between and they pull an identifier in on either end so that again they can have the whole journey but um yeah as as you said it's it's not quite as easy as in the web world where there's there's cookies everywhere and identifiers everywhere and um it's all very easy <laughs> But it also would be really interesting to see what's happening in that industry in the next few years um, as kind of like a lot of the activity shifts towards more um, mobile and app-based. Any other questions? Awesome. Once again, any, any Snowplow-related questions or anything else, um, feel free to come and find one of us. And I think, as Rebecca said, it's now time for food. <laughs>